All right, and bit of a bit of a new feature. I've got a soundboard on the computer so I can play the music before we start. Here we go. <laughs> oh, it's very, very good to be back. Lockie, it's good to have you back. How have you been, mate? I'm absolutely stoked, mate. I've had a few months off the mic, but it's good to get cracking in. We've got an absolutely cracking guest as well. Oh, cracking guest indeed. You sorted this guest out for us, which I'm absolutely chuffed about. Tell us a bit about him. Oh, mate, you know, he's an, he's an absolute superstar. Bowls 140 clicks, uh, hit, hits a big bomb, and I'm sure many of our listeners will be super keen to get into him. Where's Agar? How are we today, mate? G'day, guys. Thanks for having me on. Um, I'm bloody stoked to be on, and with an intro like that, it's... Uh, Put me under a bit of pressure here. So now looking forward to having a chat with you boys and then, yeah, getting into it. Well, mate, now speaking of under pressure, so I know that a lot of athletes, you know, they've turned to Cameo or Swish to maybe earn a bit of a buck on the side. But recently, mate, you've been attending Bucks parties trying to knock off the groomsman's head, mate. Now tell us a little bit about that. Oh, that's a good story. Um, a few... <laughs> A few years ago now, it would have been three years ago now, I um, I moved back to Melbourne for a period of my life and I moved to a club called Melbourne University Cricket Club. And when I was looking for a club to play at, at the time, I had a few coaches of different clubs call me and this one coach, um, and he goes by the name of Hugh Van Kleinberg, um, gave me a call and he said, hey, mate, we're really keen to have you down at uh, Melbourne Uni. Um come down, have a chat. Anyway, I went down, had a chat with him. Long story short, decided to play for Melbourne Uni and, and struck up a really good friendship with Huey. And, uh, yeah, I got a call one day from him saying, mate, my brother, he, he's getting married and we, we got his Bucks party and I've got this great idea. How about you come down after we've had a few sherbets and uh, have a bowl at my brother and test him out a bit. So, yeah, I went down, uh, met up with them, and yeah, they they were flying at this point, and we patted him up in full gear, and I was bowling to him, and I sort of felt a bit bad, and I was going uh, sort of medium pace at him, and he said, "Ah, give him give him a bouncer, give him a bouncer," and I was like, "All right." Anyway, so this one, I, I bowled it wide on purpose, but I, I revved it up and and dropped one short at him, and I think. <laughs> He had to change his jocks after that one. <laughs> oh, mate, I'll tell you what, I was scared just buddy watching on. I think that's the last thing I'd want after a couple of beers is a beer coming straight out of my head. But Hugh Van Kolenberg, is that Hugh Van Kolenberg of the Resilience Project? Yeah, Huey, um, great man. Uh, obviously, his work is, is Australian and almost worldwidely renowned now. Um, and I knew nothing about it beforehand, um, but now meeting him, a massive promoter of, of what he does and his work and the person he is and, and the change he makes in people's lives, even uh, if not intentionally. Just the person he, he was was infectious. His personality was infectious. And I thought if this guy's running the club, um, the people that are un- underneath him are going to be good people. And I, I guess that was the main draw card for me. I just wanted to play cricket with good blokes and, and, it, and they were good blokes. And that's how I ended up meeting him. Hit you, I'll hit you with a bit of a deep one here. Do you reckon he's changed the person you are uh, since you've met him? Uh, I think he had a great impact in my life at the time. Yeah, I think he he played a good part in developing me into having a greater awareness for what we have rather than what we want. And that has sort of stuck with me ever since. Yeah, wow, that's that's awesome stuff. And I guess we'll get back onto the cricketing journey. Before Wes was uh, bullying groomsmen on at their Bucks parties, <laughs> he, he was bowling to proper batsmen. So at the age of seventeen, you're obviously born in Victoria. You made the move yep. to South Australia. If if I'm correct, five hundred dollars in, in the bank account. You pa- you packed the car and you and you drove on over. Tell us a little bit about that move. Yeah, I guess I was really young at the time. Um, for me, I grew up loving cricket. Um, I have two brothers who also love the game, um, probably the most notable one being Ashton, who obviously has gone on and done great things and is doing great things with his career. And I was 16 when I saw him debut in the Ashes in that famous Ashes test where he made 98 on debut, um, had an amazing test. And, and when I saw that, it really clicked something for me to say, you know what, these people aren't superheroes, uh, which I saw them as, um, and this goal is an achievable one. And I think it really spurred something in me to, to give it a red hot crack. And, and a few years later, I, yeah, I had another year of under-19 cricket to go. And I thought if I'm going to make 
my play at playing cricket, I'm, I'm going to give it a red hot crack. So I moved over to South Australia for the opportunity. Um, and yeah, I, I think there's been some embellishment on the stories over the years, but I think <laughs> it wasn't, it wasn't far off 500. Um, I think my parents <laughs> gave me a few thousand dollars. I moved over, um, and I had some amazing people, uh, come into my life. I guess dad always spoke to me about you tell the world your plans and it's amazing how um, it conspires to help you. And I think there's no truer comment to uh, encapsulate my journey at that point. I moved over. I knew no one. I told my best mate whose dad previously lived here that I was moving and he sent out a scatter email and basically said, we've got this kid that wants to play cricket over in South Australia. Does anyone want to want to house him? And I got an email back within a day um, from a man named Peter Haverhock um, saying, I'm all for helping someone's journey. We want to have dinner with him and his dad and, and we'll see if he's a decent bloke. And yeah, we're open to the fact. So when I had dinner with him um, and the next day he called me, he goes, mate, you can move in whenever you want. So that family, um, the name Peter, Emma and two daughters, um, Matilda and Harper Haverhock, they, held me in the house. They had me stay there for a year, um, fed me, gave me everything and, and gave me some pretty cheap rent um, to stay there. And that sort of kick-started my journey along. So I guess I had the $2,000 in my, in my bank account, but that would run dry pretty soon. Um, <laughs> and luckily enough, I, um, I was put on and I was looking for some work and I got put on uh, to a family called the Lovebrooks who obviously you know very well lock um (laughs) and like amazing people i have a lot to thank for those people um die literally said we've got a farm up here and i it's been embellished over time at a time in this dairy (laughs) farm but it's it's just (laughs) it was just a farm hand working up in my law at the time and she if she didn't have work she found work for me and just it's, it was something that kept me busy during the day but also helped me pay my rent. And for that year where I wasn't a contracted cricketer and I was training and I was playing and I was trying to make my way, it allowed me to stay in Adelaide. It allowed me to uh, push harder for my goals and it gave me a, a real purpose of hard work and and what I needed to do to get there. So there's a people that I haven't named in that, but a lot of people really helped me at the start of my journey. Yeah, well, if they're listening, uh, big hello to Peter, Emma, Matilda, uh, Harper. I'm, I'm losing track. Die, baby, as well. Uh, Ashton. Uh, you mentioned a lot of yeah. names there, but uh, big, big hello to all of them if they're listening. Yeah, well, um, I reckon Sophie will be filthy. She didn't get a shout out, Wes. Oh, <laughs> oh Sophie, sorry. sorry. Hello, Sophie. Well, hello, the Sophie. whole the whole Lovebrook family. Yeah, <laughs> massive love for them and 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 for what they helped me achieve. Yeah. So I think, am I right in saying you're from like Malvern originally in Melbourne? Uh, going to work on a farm, bit of a, is that a bit of a fish out of water situation? <laughs> yeah, I reckon it is. I um, Yeah, born born in Melbourne, grew up Bentley. So yeah, it's, it's city boys they come. You, you want to know a city boy, you're looking straight at one. Um, but funnily enough, for some reason I have this love of country music and always have since a little kid. So I, I sort of used to sit on the beach or in Melbourne looking at probably a skyline or a highway, uh, not far, far from a koala in a tree, I'll give you the hot tip, but, um, <laughs> and I'd listen to my country music and imagine what it was like to, to be out there in the country air and enjoying it. So I think when I went up there, it was a bit of a, a dream come true for me, riding around on a ride on mower, or getting to ride the tractors around. I was pretty, I was pretty, I was like a pig in mud at that. At that time, <laughs> mate, I'm sure that they need some more work done. So if you ever want to pop over there and <laughs> fork some hay, I'll have you. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Any particular uh, particular country music tracks that uh, bit of, get a bit of repetition in your car? Oh, mate, there's too many to count. Um, my favorite, my favorite at the moment is a guy called Morgan Wallen who released an album not long ago. Aussie? Uh, pardon? Is he Aussie or American? American, there is them. There are a lot of Americans. I'm not. I'm not um, too shabby on uh, Keith Thurban. I like him a lot. I reckon he's not bad. Um, Luke Combs is another one that I love. Uh, 
And, yeah, the list goes on, boys. You can't really pin one down. But, yeah, if, you, if you're in my car driving, you, you can guarantee yourself that I'll have country music on. Yeah, beautiful, to be honest. I think the closest thing I listen to country music is Taylor Swift, so I'm not going to add too much <laughs> to, this, <laughs> this, to this conversation. But um, still, mate, you were only 18 years of old, um, old super close with um, both your brothers and your family and your parents. Like, it must have been so tough moving out of home at such a such a young age and going, like, you know, you know no nobody in South Australia. Like, how, how did you go about that? Yeah, it was tough. It was very tough. Um, I think chasing your dreams is something that is you know is going to be tough um but yeah I, I did struggle a little bit with it but I was really grateful that I had those people around me um I'm now looking back even more grateful that I got to live with a family I think that gave me an environment at a at a young age to still have that homely environment made a world of difference uh to the way I saw South Australia I saw it then as as like a second home to me and now I see it as a first home um, but allowed to allowed that to happen um, and then I was lucky enough to be involved with Adelaide University Cricket Club who had at the time a few imports over from England so those boys were sort of in the similar boat to me similar age um, in the Darren Lehman Academy it's called over here who have English boys come over play cricket for the summer they train and I befriended a lot of those boys and ended up getting to the point where I had a bedroom at their house. Like I'd spend that much time with them and, and having them through that period uh, allowed me to build a close friendship group for that first year at least that allowed me to get settled. And once I was settled, I was sort of away with my time in uh, South Australia. Yeah, mate. And I guess the uh, it really paid off because you ended up making your List A debut as well when you were eight, just 18 years old. I mean, that must yeah. have been at the wildest dreams of like what you'd achieve in your first season. Yeah, it was a um, it was an incredible experience. So a fair bit went into getting there and I'll, I'll run you through that story. Um, I basically, while I was living in Adelaide, obviously we touched on working on, on the farm there and I was washing dishes as well at, at, a, at, a, at a restaurant um, in Gilly Street at the time. But while I was doing that, I was training for the under-19 state squad um, and luckily enough, I got picked in that squad. Um, and did really well in the under-19 carnival. So my cricketing journey was going really well. Um, and then I got picked up and in short in the short squad to play for the under-19 Australian World Cup. And this was a year where we were going to go to Bangladesh. So there was the jig was out whether we were going to go or not. And, and we weren't sure, but we played a, a quad series in Dubai, I'm pretty sure it was. So two it over there. I unfortunately only took one wicket in four games, so I didn't do too great. But um, came back from that experience and through grade performances and the under nineteen performances, got a opportunity to play second eleven cricket for South Australia and made my second eleven debut against Western Australia. Um, and we batted first. And I think we made maybe two hundred, and they sent us. Um, we were all out and I reckon we had 30 minutes before end of play on day one to go and have a bowl. And I got chucked the new ball and luckily enough took three wickets before close of play. And that night I got sat down by Tim Nielsen and got told that I'd be getting offered a rookie contract the next year and came to preseason next year. Like I said, a pig in mud. I'd, I'd, I'd got the dream of getting the contract and now I just wanted to play. And it led to that moment of, of getting my cap for South Australian one-day cricket um, at the WACA against WA, a strong WA side. And I remember my first three balls uh, got smacked to the boundary for four <laughs> off Hilton Cartwright at the time. And I thought, gee, this is harder than I thought it was. <laughs> um, and my brother was in the stand and I ended up bowling really well that day. I got two for 43 for memory and we drew the game. It was a tie Um Tied game, so it's a pretty hard one to forget, but a very memorable moment for me because it was the start of what is now has been a, a really interesting career for me. 
Yeah, absolutely. And you mentioned your brother in the stands at your debut. Uh, just going kind of off track just for a sec, Lockie yeah. found a picture online of uh, you at your brother's test debut, uh, Ashton, in England. <laughs> Bit of an eye-catching shirt. It was it was a ripper shirt, I've got to say. Do you remember your outfit on that day? Oh, of course I remember. My family doesn't <laughs> let me forget it. So <laughs> I dressed up, but I didn't really want to wear what I wanted to wear. I wanted to go to... I think I didn't have much money about that. You know, when it's like in high school, you save all week to get 20 bucks in your pocket. And I reckon I saved up for about five weeks and I only had a hundred bucks. And I really wanted a suit. And it was around the time where um, where the uh, prince got off, I can't remember his name, but the daughter's, the, the sister was Pippa Middleton. Yeah, and uh, yeah. I said to my mum, I said, I want to be the Pippa of, of the show. I said, if Ash is debuting... Get me in a suit on the sidelines. I'll do my hair nice and I want to get the attention, right? And it sounds really vain at the time and it probably was. So my family, my nickname through my family now is Pippa uh, because I just wanted to dress up and catch someone's eye or something and get a few Instagram followers, I think. <laughs> so there's the story behind the shirt. Did you get a few Instagram followers? Yeah, I did, but I think it was just people just following Ash, so they followed me. But uh. Uh, we can say it's from the shirt. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I, I think we can all certainly say it's definitely not a, a forgettable outfit. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I definitely won't. And it comes up every time I have conversations. I'll give it a tip. But no, I'm proud of it. Proud of it. I'll, uh, I'll own it. Yeah, de- mate, definitely, definitely. And then so just, I guess, while, whilst we're on Ashton debut, it's about you, but it must you touched on it before. Was that really the moment where you sort of felt like a career was possible in cricket, watching your brother sort of play at the highest highest level? Yeah, I guess it was because for me, I well, oh, I still am. I'm a pretty happy-go-lucky kind of bloke. I I um I sort of just was, was at school. I played cricket because I loved it. I played footy in the winter because I loved it and I enjoyed time with my mates and my family. And I sort of never really thought about too much past like today or tomorrow um, kind of setup. And, and when I saw that, it really – gave me a feeling of um, inspiration, motivation, goal settings, I guess. And I looked at that and I said, I, w- I want to do that. Um, and there was a moment I can still remember that I, I sat there and I said, I want this to be me is when they walk out in an Ashes test in England, they walk out and you might have seen on the test to a song called Jerusalem. Um, and it's an amazing experience to watch live when the players walk out, the ground's silent and they play this almost a royal type song um, that echoes around the ground. And I remember watching Ash, he just stood there and he just did a circle looking at the ground as he walked out to bat. And I was standing at that moment. I said, I want to do that one day. And so it's still a goal of mine to achieve. But yeah, it really set in stone for me that I wanted to do that for my career. And that's something I wanted to be. And fortunately enough, I've now been able to do it. Did he give you any like little lessons or anything like that after that debut? I think you're like 16 years old or something, but did he like say, say anything um, at that time to help spur you along? At that time, no. He's Ash has always been my big brother, and if, if you know him well, he's, he's a very level-headed bloke. Um, he's like, I always say he's like a second dad. He's always protective, loving, caring, and just wants the best for his brothers and his family. So for me, growing up, having a brother that's, played years before you and experienced things before you have, he basically taught me lessons um, that he learned before I got to experience them. And I guess that's held me in really good stead um, leading into my career now. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And some people might not be like totally uh, OSA knowledgeable about cricket. So Ashton Agar, 98, not out on test debut in the Ashes. Just incredible, incredible stuff. But uh, you, you mentioned you've got another brother there. I gave a million people a little hello before. What's your other brother's name? Will. Uh, we call him Wilbur. Um, he, he just bought an apartment in Melbourne with his partner. Um, he works at Sportsbet in, in the marketing department at Sportsbet which he doesn't like me because I think I spend too much money on the sports bet at the moment, especially with the Melbourne Cup just passed. Um, so he has to sort of block my account a few times. Um, but no, he's, he's, um, he was a great cricketer as well um, and just ended up doing his own thing now. And, and 
fortunate enough he's forged a really good career for himself now. So, yeah, Will's my middle brother. He's 16 months older than me and Ash is three years older, older than me. Mate, it would have been awesome growing up with, like, your brothers so close together in age. I'm sure the backyard cricket battles growing up would have just been mental. And I hope that <laughs> even after Ashton made his debut, you still bowled at his head. Famous, is, famous goal. It's the best. It was the best. We, we still talk about it to this day. We used to have like a, a perfect rectangle front yard with grass and there was two bear patches from where we'd bat and where we'd bowl and we had our own rules um, that we'd play. And honestly, we'd play from the moment we got home from school till it was dark. And it's probably a reason I didn't do too well at school and it's because I was probably <laughs> holding a cricket bat or bowling a cricket ball um, most of my time when I wasn't there. But to be able to have two brothers similar age to grow up with, learn off, play front yard cricket with challenge. And to this day, you know, he Ash comes to my place in Adelaide for a shield game and he'll come over for dinner and if the garage is empty, we, we'll go out there and we'll play cricket down the driveway again <laughs> or we'll be down my hallway throwing cricket balls at each other. It, it, it never <laughs> stops. And I guess that kid in you and that love for the game is something that um, is really important and something that he brought up in, in my recent cap presentation for Australia, you just said, remember that boy. And I guess that's that's why we fell in love with the game and that's why we still love it. Oh, I love that, mate. And that, that environment that you're talking about, that just sounds like the absolute, if you're going to create an environment to make the perfect cricketers, that just sounds like <laughs> it. Oh, mate, we loved it. We honestly, um, if you lived in our neighbourhood, you knew us as the boys that played cricket um, <laughs> or the annoying people that always knocked on your door to get a tennis ball back from your backyard. <laughs> Um, so no, everyone knew us as, as the boys that would play in the front yard and no, it was an awesome, awesome childhood and I'm very grateful for it. Yeah, your dad played too, yeah? Yep. Dad played for Paran in Melbourne in, in premier cricket, um, played A grade cricket level, um, and was just a huge lover of the game and, and passionate, uh, about just getting us out and, and playing cricket. And I guess he was always worried that he was too intense or, Am I pushing you guys too hard? But he never pushed us. And we just love the game. And I think we fed off his love for the game and it, it just flowed into us. And I guess when when you got a dad that that loves it so much, it's it's inevitable that's gonna be in your blood. Yeah, phenomenal. And I'm sure we could talk about how many uh how many glass windows you broke throughout the time. <laughs> but we'll uh we'll get we'll get back onto the uh the cricketing journey and then so I think so you, you leave South Australia to return home to Victoria. What was sort of the motivation behind that decision? Was it just, did you miss your family? Were you not necessarily loving it at South Australia at the time? Because like, you were still at the Strikers as well, if I'm correct. Yeah, it was a massive, massive thing for me. So the year after I debuted for South Australia, I played six list A games, um, was in contention for Shield cricket, um, had had a great season, a great year. And, I'd, I'd moved out with a few mates at that time um, and was living with them. And I guess for me, I was still young. I was 18, just turned 19. And in the house that I was living at, things sort of went a bit pear-shaped. I had friends move out who had furniture and they took their furniture. So therefore, I was left with my mates sitting in a bear house on deck chairs <laughs> thinking, what's happened? Um, <laughs> I, I literally thought, I don't know what's going on here. Um, and it sort of just spiralled from there a little bit for me. I, I just, I struggled because of that. I was had no one really to turn to in South Australia to go and catch up with or to take my time away. We didn't have a TV. And I just felt like it was a, a hole that you can't really get out of at the time. Um, and the only thing for me I saw was maybe maybe I need to get home. Um, and I had a big – so all of that was happening um, and I think it got to a peak one day when I called Dad and I said, Dad, you just need to come over and, and, and just be here. I don't know what's going on. I just need your help. Um, and Dad flew over and he was flying in to watch uh, me play cricket at the time. And that morning he flew in. I text the boys, I'm going to be late for cricket. Um, and I drove to pick him up and I came back, even though I'd text the boys, I'm going to be late. And I got into the rooms and basically the coach said, you're late, you need to buy a slab of beer for the boys. And I was like, fair enough, I've got to buy a slab of beer for the boys. Uh, I'll, um, I'll, I'll put my car behind the bar after the game and the boys can get as many drinks as 
as they want, equaling up to a slab basically, or I'll put 50 bucks behind the bar. And I guess maybe I'd been a little bit of hard to deal with through that period and maybe it hit ahead for, for the coach at the time and he basically said, no, get cash out. And for me, it just felt like a kick in the guts. I thought, you know what, if you're doing that, um, it's 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 a attack at me, I felt. Um, and I literally broke and I, I broke out at him and basically told him exactly what I thought of him. Um, tears rushing down my face. Uh, and I think everything leading up to that point just hit ahead and I just basically the volcano erupted and, and I remember knowing dad had come to watch me play cricket and he'd said something along the lines to the captain of he's not bowling today, simple as that, after I'd blown up and I got in my car that game and got dad in the car and I said I'm not playing and didn't play that great game. And obviously South Australia found out and basically said, you need to speak to us, something's happening here. Um, so had a meeting with South Australia and just said, I'm not in the right place, not in the right headspace, things aren't, aren't working for me and I need to sort it out. And it was a really hard conversation to have because I love South Australia, I love soccer. Um, but for my mental health at the time, I think I was really young and couldn't deal with the challenges that I had to face. And consequently, I, I made the decision to move back um, to Victoria uh, just to, to get my head right, um, to get in out of that hole that I spoke of that I felt like I couldn't get out of, spend time at home and, and have a fresh start and made the decision to move back to Victoria and, and did so. Yeah, mate. There's a lot to unpack there. I guess yeah. I think like I think people at Harper's like at, you're around the same age you are now, eighteen, nineteen. It is a really tough time, especially sort of being out of home. And I guess you're on a rookie contract at the time with South Australia. But what's it like being you're a professional cricketer on a rookie contract where you're tr tr expected to train as a professional <laughs> cricketer, but you're probably not necessarily paid paid to what where you can just like it, it'd be a pretty tough thing, wouldn't it? Yeah. It, 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 Early doors, it is tough, but at the same time, it's it's still decent money. Um, it's money that you can definitely live off um, yeah. and, and have a nice life off um, at the time. And I was fortunate enough because I'd played six games. I was on a full contract. I got upgraded through games okay. to a fuller contract. So, yeah, living in terms for me wasn't that bad. Um, I just guess it was the lifestyle away from the game that I didn't have down – Part and something I didn't uh, have a state uh, have stability away from the games. So when uh, shit hit the fan, basically I um I didn't know how to deal with it, and it was a it was a good thing now looking back because it allowed me to to sort stuff out. And if anything did hit the fan now, I'd I'd know how to how to go about it, and I'd be okay. So do you think? So I guess like comparing from what. Like back then, where that was it 2017, 2018, around that period, compared yeah. to what South Australia has in place now, do you think the welfare programs that they had for you for young players was sufficient? I do. Yep. I just think I was too young to be able to have the maturity to seek it out. I think the welfare of the players is is fantastic in cricket circles. Um, we have some great support around us. Um, and we know we need to seek it, but I think it's come in recent times with people talking and, and speaking openly if you're struggling, uh, whatever it might be with, um, being able to have that. And I didn't have the confidence to do that, and that was on me. So, like, you're obviously back in South Australia now. Have mm. they oh, – obviously, they were good enough before, but have they just taken that next uh, step up and become even better since then? Oh, South Australia – I cannot express my love more for, for this state and, and the organisation of South Australian Cricket Association. Um, when I left, I left um, on good terms, them knowing what I was dealing with and going through at the time. Um, they basically said, you're always welcome back if you wanted to come back. Um, I knew that they'd say that at the time and I honestly thought, well, if I did have to come back, I might have to earn my right to get a contract again, um, and I was okay with that. Um, but spending two years in Victoria, I remember I, I got to a game and 
we were playing against South Australia and I was sitting on the bench running the drinks for Victoria, watching South Australia, and I just thought to myself, I'm watching my brothers play cricket here. I'm, I'm playing against South Australia and part of me just, well, all of me wanted South Australia to win that game because to me, they're my brothers. They were, they were everything to me and they were my family. And I just went, that's the moment for me where I said, no, this isn't the place I need to play my cricket. I need to be playing my cricket back in South Australia. And luckily enough, I, my manager after the season contacted South Australia and um, I ended up moving back. Yeah, awesome, man. I, I, I'm not. Uh, I, I don't know as much about the kind of cricket rules and everything like that as you two definitely do. But you played for South Australia and Victoria. Most sports, most things like that, you can only play for one country, one state. So how does that eligibility work, where you can just switch between them? Well, basically, it's a contract system. So it's it's a lot similar to the AFL codes, where um, you're on a contract for a certain period of time and when that contract period's up, you're basically a free agent. And if someone, if you want to go somewhere else and they're willing to have you, you can sign a contract with them and then you're binded towards that state. So, yeah, I only had a one-year contract in South Australia. So when I moved home, I moved back to Victoria, but I actually didn't have a contract. So I went home uh, without any security financially in terms of a state contract um, in Victoria. But luckily enough, the year after that, picked up a contract with Victoria and that's how I played for them. Um, in terms of Big Bash, um, it's a completely separate fan franchise. So state cricket stops entirely uh, when the Big Bash season is on. So players from all states can go to different teams and play for them because it's a different franchise. Um, it's a separate contract in itself. If that yeah. explains it well enough, yeah, I'm yeah, not yeah. sure. <laughs> that makes sense. But so, because of this contract <laughs> thing, um, like you, you have connections to Victoria and South Australia, but could you play for like Queensland or WA or Tasmania? Uh, right now, I couldn't because I'm contractually signed to South Australia. Yeah, but like where, when you're a free agent, you, yeah, you could? I could go okay, wherever I want. right. So it's not really like representative of players actually from the state. You've got players from all over the place playing with you. Yeah, yeah. Right, um, and right. That, that's I mentioned earlier in, in the I moved to South Australia for opportunity, and that was from Victoria. So I played all my junior cricket in Victoria. I played under seventeen state cricket for Victoria, but I moved to South Australia because I thought that's where I could get my opportunity. And a lot of people do that, and I think it's very similar to AFL circles. You know, you see players who are in powerful sides in the AFL not getting a game, so say someone playing for Richmond couldn't get a game so they go you know what I'm going to move to St Kilda and if I can get a game there and really show my talent then all of a sudden um, their career blossoms so it's a bit the same in cricket <clears throat> if you wanted to obviously for me I'm, uh, I love South Australia and I don't think I want to play my cricket anywhere else. Yeah, we can definitely see that scene. You've <laughs> just brought a, pro brought a property over there and you speak about playing with your brother. So we can see that you are, you truly believe the South Australian colours. And But those two years in Victoria, I mean, how was it? Because I, I think Victorian, the Victorian cricket system, I don't know how much you can sort of give it, as, as you, I don't know how you can come on another state, but I guess you, obviously you're from Victoria, you don't play there. Ashton's from Victoria, he's never played there. There's been I've seen a few things sort of pop up in relation to, you know, the grade. Um, system in which a lot of like there's like pretty much 90% of the players come from three clubs and you know I think there's been a fair bit of recent discussion about cricket in Victoria do you have any sort of like how did you find it in your when you experienced it over the two years because I think you played a few one day games but yep. that's yeah Victoria as a, as a collective have always been a tough cricket team they win a lot um, and they breed toughness um, for a player like me, as a bloke, I'm pretty happy-go-lucky, I guess, at the time. Um, but I learned some tough lessons there and lessons that I needed to learn to be a better cricketer. At the time, I didn't like them, but the players, the people, the organisation bred toughness into the cricketers. And if there was a problem, you sorted it out. If you weren't good enough, you get better to be good enough. Um, no one held your hand and I think for me moving there, it changed me in a way that I looked at my training, I looked at my preparation, I looked at the person I was and how the questions I was asking myself um, and it really made me, uh, yeah, it toughened my skin, it calloused me 
Um, so I think at the time I found it a struggle, but I'm really grateful for the organisation that they were because I think I'm a much better cricketer for having experienced time in that setup. Yeah, right. And people often like put toughness hand in hand with less of a focus on health, like mental and physical, and it's just all about results, results, results. That, that sounds like exactly what the case was there. So you reckon they kind of sacrificed a bit of the, uh, like, yeah, focus on health for results? Um, no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that. No, I'd say that they're in terms of their cricket, they were tough. Um, everyone away from the game were were nice people, um, great people, and and I still to this day stay in contact with people like Scott Boland, who was a great mentor for me and. And almost like was like a big brother there um, to me, and I think it's just in terms of your cricket. If you're not good enough, get better, work harder, understand what you need to do um, to be better. Um, and in that terms, they were tough. And I think, yeah, like you said, you can talk about toughness as as, as you got to be mentally tough or you have got to be physically tough. I just think in terms of grit. Um, I'm talking about it at Victoria when a game's on a line, having the grit to in your 35th over when you're cooked and you're cramping, how am I getting through here? What's my mental state in terms of I want to win this game rather than, oh, I'll just get through and bowl. Um, I think that's what I talk about toughness um, in terms of what I learned at Victoria. They, they taught me how to play to win rather than just playing. Yeah, and I think it's easy to see that, you know, you took those lessons on toughness when you moved back to South Australia in 2019. I think great pre-season, got yourself super, super fit. You weren't, you had your Shield debut, cat presented by Peter George. That must have just been an amazing feeling. Yeah, it was an amazing period of my life. I, I guess it, I look back on it now and it, it almost is like a big blur. I think I, at that point, was questioning whether I was good enough to play state cricket I'd had multiple chances at it and never really succeeded too well um and so when I went back to South Australia I I almost saw it as my last chance to bite the bullet and 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 get better and I remember I yeah had a session one night that I I'd missed due to uh one morning that I'd missed due to sleeping in and I got, a, I got a pretty big slap on the wrist um, for that and I, I looked at myself and I said, what are you doing? You've been gifted an opportunity and you're not going to do that again. I think that moment really flicked the switch in me um, and I wanted to be better and I lost a lot of weight um, and put a lot of effort in, into playing my cricket. Um, but I guess what people don't know is I played the first one day game again and, and got smacked around again um, and got dropped from that one day side the start of that year. and. Joe Many at the time, two games later, tore his hamstring, which gave me my opportunity again. And I bowled in a Tasmanian uh, one day against Tassie. And, and I bowled all right. I bowled maybe 10 overs for 40-odd. Um, felt really good, um, but didn't take a wicket. And then after that game, I just, I'd just i always played white ball cricket. And every time I'd bowled, I'd be... Basically, batters were coming at me to hit the boundary, and I didn't know how to deal with that. I didn't know I was under pressure from ball one, and I never really got the opportunity to settle in in cricket terms on a length. And getting my debut cup for South Australia playing Shield cricket, it just changed my whole uh, career, I guess, getting that opportunity because it was the first time at state level I felt like I wasn't under as much pressure. Because of the long format of the game, I was able to bowl. 30 overs settling in on, on hard length and just became robotic for me at the time. And I remember a day after that shield game, we pl- we played the one, we play with, we were playing the one day and I just bowled 35 overs at the same length. And I said, you know, what? I'm just going to do the same thing. And fortunately enough, I got my first five wicket haul um, in that game. And oh, it just went from there. I took another five wickets against Western Australia. And I guess I was on my way in that season and, yeah, it was an amazing season um, for me and, and something that I guess was my breakout um, here and led me to where I am now. Mate, it was simply ph- simply phenomenal just to reel off a couple of, couple of the numbers. So I think you're the only bowler who was top 10 in uh, all wickets across the three different domestic cricket competitions. Um, 
Bradman Young Cricketer of the Year, uh, n- numerous, I guess, Shield um, Team of the Year, whether it was Crick Info, Cricket.com. Um, what do you put that success down to? Because it's pretty crazy. As you said, this, you made your Shield debut that year and then suddenly you were in the best best 11 as voted by numerous judges. And I'll just say something very quickly. Uh, another little important number. You're 24 years old, mate. You're speaking beyond your years. All this stuff that you've gone through, it's <laughs> bloody incredible for a 24-year-old. Oh, yeah, I don't want to sit here and say and, and speak a sob story, but no, it's been, yeah, it's been a, um, it's been a great journey. And to get to where I am now and then be through those ups and downs, I remember early doors, like Kieran Pollard once said to me, he said he plays West Indies and he was playing for strikers. He said, you need to go through this young because you'll know how to deal with it when you're older. And I always remember that now. And I'm grateful I went through the hard yards young because now I look at cricket as, as a game and, and the sun comes up tomorrow. But yeah, it's it's been incredible. Um, sorry, Locke, what was your question again? I, I, just so that, so all, all good. Thanks, Haas, for jumping in. I know. <laughs> I hijacked that a bit there. Sorry about that, mate. <laughs> but, uh, was just, a, just about, so that successful 2019, you know, 2020 season, yeah. like, what do you what do you put that down to? What was the biggest difference from you before and after? Was it, was it maturity? Because obviously, like I said, you're the best young cricketer of the year, numerous teams of the year, you know, it was a pretty successful season. Yeah, I think it was a, um, I think it was a, a mix of things, to be honest. I moved back from South, uh, from Victoria, like I said, with that grit. Um, I'd been calloused in Victoria, so I trained with purpose. I played with purpose, um, and I'd moved back, and and I was playing with my family again. You know, the boys at South Australia, my brothers, and I, I will always say these boys are my brothers. They're family to me because they've given me everything over here, and it's a different feeling when you run out with with boys that you love. You know, it's a different feeling um, to play with them and and wanting to succeed for them. And I had just had a massive emotion of me every time I walked out next to them, looking next to me and seeing the guys that I knew um, looked after me and cared genuinely for me. Um, I knew walking out next to them that, that they had my back and it, it stilled me with a lot of confidence. Um, my strength and conditioning coach, Stephen Schwert, was phenomenal in – his care for me in terms of knowing what I could, I had to offer, but knowing that I needed to work hard to get it out and he wasn't scared to tell me that. Um, and I took it on board and I, I worked really hard to get fit um, with his help. I think it's all down to that. And yeah, I guess we spoke briefly before about, uh, about mental health. Um, and I guess not many people know through that year was probably the hardest year of my life in terms of mental health, away out of the game. And when I was playing cricket, it was an escape. And for me, I it literally everything faded away when I was playing cricket. And it was a place where I didn't think too much about what was going on off the field. And um, I guess for me, that played a big part in actually having success on it. You said it was uh, the hardest year you've had in terms of mental health. Can I ask why that was? Yeah. Um, I guess for me, I guess it was since I was 13, I have been suffering f- with OCD, which is called obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, and I guess when you think of obsessive compulsive disorder, people think of you need to have things tidy or in a row or you need to have the light switches a certain way. And I guess that's just a real surface um knowledge of what it is um for me i suffered really hard with it um in terms of success in terms of the person i was um the person i wanted to be um and my disorder went a lot further than just having cups straight or um things clean you can you just have to look at my bedroom to know i'm not the tidiest person in the world um so for me Away from the game, I struggled really hard with different mental mental sides of things. I had to have my thoughts in certain patterns um, or I thought my success wouldn't continue. Um, every game I'd go in thinking I had to do different routines to make sure I'd, I'd keep um, the lifestyle I had, um, the people in my life around. Um, and basically... Anything I couldn't control, I tried to control with different routines or superstitions. Um, And I guess it got to the point where there was nights where I'd spend six hours 
getting in and out of bed just to do it properly uh, in terms of of OCD. To give you an example, when 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 it's at its worst, um, for people who don't know it, my one was I had to have a good thought when I got into bed. I had to think of me being successful uh, when I got into bed um, without any negative thoughts um, to then continue that the next day. And for me, I guess I was getting into bed and as it does, it, you tell yourself not to think of a pink elephant. The first thing that comes up in your head is a pink elephant. So when you when you try not to think of something, it always pops up and I'd have nights where I'd just I'd get my pillow and I'd lie on the floor because I'd be scared to get into bed thinking I'd have a thought that would trigger a chain of events that would make me get in and out of bed till any hour of the morning, um, to give an example, and little things like that um, away from the game that would basically, yeah, ruin, ruin not ruining my life, but they'll have playing a big part in um, not helping me uh, be pretty mentally stable away from the game. Um, but I was really thankful that I had support around me to help me deal with that and deal through it. And I guess OCD is something that never really goes away fully. It's something that you have strategies in place with to deal with and it's something I still deal with today. And, yeah, I guess to put it light, like that's a pretty broad overview of, of what happened with me. But, yeah, I, I struggled really hard through that year with, with that disorder. Yeah, wow, mate, that's it's a pretty amazing insight. Like, I think it's definitely, I think one of the first things you said is relation to OCD and I'd be exactly the same. I hear somebody's OCD, I think, oh, no, yeah, you've got to have something in particular order or whatever. Like, it's it's really interesting, I guess, how tough it, and the um, impact it can have on your every, everyday life. Like, yeah. it's pretty. I think uh, it's, yeah, I think it's something that there was a time there when I thought, I guess it's like when you got a cold and you lose your voice and people go, gee, I wish I had my voice back or I wish I was thankful when I just like had a normal voice and I can't wait till I can talk properly again. And for me, it was that, but with my thoughts. Because my OCD and I had to think positively so much, I found myself daily controlling my thoughts and I wasn't able to be present. I wasn't able to um, live in the moment because everything I was doing, I was trying to control in my own head. Um, and it became for me, it was a matter of, of um, moments. So a moment could be opening a car door and if by natural human nature a thought came in your head that wasn't great, I had to redo it until I thought a good thought without a bad thought. And you end up getting scared to move because <laughs> you never know when a bad thought's going to pop in your head. And that's why I say all I wanted to do was control my mind to think good thoughts and it just be relaying things over and over. And it just, it's so draining. Um, and I guess, yeah, it was, it was something that was a really hard time for me. Is there anything that you'd tell yourself back then that maybe your support network just didn't even think to tell you and that might, might have helped you out? Um, I've had good conversations with my brother around mental health. Ashton obviously came out in um, the Nery Lee Meadows podcast and spoke about his challenges uh, with anxiety. Um, and I, I found myself telling him and he agreed is you know the answers already. You know the answers of what you need or want people to say to be better, but no one's going to tell you it because – you, no one's you. They're not going to say it in the perfect way you want to hear it. Um, so I guess if I was looking back to myself now and speaking to him, I'd, I'd say to that younger self, trust your gut. Trust what you think will work. You don't need other people to tell you how to fix it when you know the answer. And I guess that, that answer was, for me, it was understanding this disorder. It was understanding what was going on in my head to make me feel so anxious at those times where I had bad thoughts or I had a moment where I felt like I needed to reopen that car door, you know, um, to actually go back, understand what's going on in my brain that makes me feel that way was a really good way of me then knowing that what I thought, say, oh, you're not going to, 
you're going to lose your contract and you're going to be done in the next year, which might have been a negative thought, um, isn't going to happen and it's not real. And it's just your brain uh, basically a chemically imbalanced a little bit at that time um, trying to protect you because it doesn't know the difference between, uh, like there's the cliche goes, a lion, run, a lion running at you or the anxiety we bring in ourselves. Yeah, and I think just in terms of an outsized perspective, you look and you seem like you're in a very good headspace at the moment. I, I could be totally wrong with that, but you, you're seeming like happy to talk about it and just open and absolutely lovely, brilliant guy, clearly. And I think yeah. all, all the, um, yeah, all, all, all your hard work from previous years, you, you were talking about your connection to South Australia. Have you got much of a co- uh, connection to Barbados? <laughs> <laughs> oh, too much of a connection to Barbados. No, I, um, <laughs> no, I it's a special place for me, um, but more so than anything, um, I guess it's a realisation of my dream. I look back at that and the first thing that pops into my mind is that cricket ground um, and standing there in that circle looking at my brother who was trying hard to get me to cry but I couldn't bite my lip harder to stop crying. <laughs> and I said, there's one thing you're not doing and that's crying on live TV. Um, no, it was an amazing period of my life. Um, I remember I was at my brother Ashton's wedding a few months earlier and he asked me, he said, have you been told anything about the upcoming one day T20 series? And I hadn't got a call at this time. And I said, nah, I haven't heard anything. And and open and honestly, I said to Ash, you know, I don't think I'm there yet. I think I need to develop my game a bit more. And then I think I've got more to improve to before I play international cricket. I don't think I'm, I'm there. I don't think I'm good enough yet to play that. Um, and didn't think anything of it. And I was down the coast swagging up, going fishing with my mate when I got a call from my manager saying there's boys pulling out of, of this tour due to the COVID reasons, which is 100% fair enough in my view. Um, you, you might be a chance. And then again, heard nothing after that. And Saka had told me I needed to lose some weight because I'd put on some weight last season and they said you need to get fit in the off-season. So I was lucky enough to have a mate, Lloyd Pope, who basically went, righto, you're coming with me to this gym and we're going running. And I was running with him and I was about a K off finishing and I looked at my phone because it was calling and it said George Bailey. And I was like, oh, no, I've got to finish my run. And I guess I was like, oh, what do I do? So I let the call go through, unfortunately. <laughs> I reckon you're the first person to ever let the head selector's phone call go through. <laughs> and I'll tell you what, I said, I'm not a fast runner. The boys call me a big tractor, but I have not run faster in my life that last K. I sprinted back to the finish line, got a call from George Bailey uh, and called him back and I said, I'm so sorry, mate. I was on a run. And he goes, ah. Oh, he goes, the oldest trick in the book, mate. You pretend you're puffed and tell the selector you're on a run. <laughs> I said, no, nah, I promise I was. I was, mate. I promise. <laughs> but no, and then anyway, he, he basically said to me, he goes, there's boys pulling out um, and you're on standby for the trip. And so it was a bit of a, well, am I in, am I not? He goes, worst case scenario. He goes, we're taking you up to Brisbane next week to get ready. Worst case you're prepared and you're ready earlier for the season and you go back to South Australia and you keep training. Best case scenario, you're on, you're on a plane in two weeks to Barbados. And I remember getting off the phone and I, I said to Pope, I said, I'm not in, but I'm close. And I think two days passed um, and I got a call from Trevor Hones just out the front of my manager's, um, my manager's office, which is fitting because he's been basically like – family to me over here and the one person I can trust um, and and love over here. So everything that good happens to me, I I share it with him. And so fittingly, I was about to walk in his office and I got this call from Trevor Holmes and I I didn't have Trevor Holmes' number at the time. And I answered and I just went, hello? And you know when you answer the phone, you don't know who it is and you're expecting them to say something. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And he said, Wes? And I said, Yes. (laughs) <laughs> he said, where's Trevor Holmes here? And I went, oh, hi, Trevor, how are you going? <laughs> and anyway, basically he told me, he said, mate, you're in the squad, you're going, you're on the plane, congratulations. And emotion poured out of me. Um, 
and I think it just hits you when when you get told you're playing for Australia. Oh, you, you you're touring with Australia. I ran up and I just I grabbed my I hugged my manager. I was bawling my eyes out in happiness. Um, and yeah, for the rest of the day, I called um, my mum, my my dad, my brothers. I called Ash, and I was just like, I'm in. That's all I said to him. I just said, I'm in. I'm going. And yeah, it's a moment I'll never forget. Um, I chucked on some country music and I just drove along the beach. Thinking, <laughs> Uh, life's pretty good at the moment. So, yeah, that, that, that happened and then got on the plane and flew over to the West Indies, um, an amazing experience because I'd never flown um, first class or anything like that um, before and basically got to West Indies and we played the 2020 series and I, di- I didn't play in any of those games. Um, but I had an inkling I might have played the one day and Justin Langer came up to me and at the last T20 in um, St. Lucia, when we were bowling before the game, just the people that weren't playing would train. And he basically said to me, he said, when you bowl today, he goes, bowl like it's the first ball in international cricket, your first ball in international cricket. Every ball you bowl is like you're bowling in that one day. He goes, don't you dare give yourself any leeway. He goes, make sure you're on from ball one. And I was thankfully, and and it, like I, I basically felt inspired by that, and I said, "Bloody oath, I'm going to be on in that training." And it gave me an inkling that I might play. And we we flew to Barbados and we trained, and we had a big training session. And because of this inkling, every every time I bowled, I was trying my best to be on. I just had those words ringing in my ears, and I remember two days out from the game, um, I got a got training and I was bowling and Justin Lang was, was umpire and I was giving everything. I was bowling short. I was trying to bowl fast. I was trying everything and I was bowling with a few good players. And after training, I got out of the bus at the hotel and, and JL tapped me on the shoulder and he said, you're ready to go youngster. And me being a bit stuffed for words, like started out at, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, I'm ready. Go. <laughs> of course. Yeah, sure. Of course. Absolutely. Um, and then he just he just smiled and nodded, and then we got in the lift, and it was me, him, and Mitchell Stark in the lift. And he said to Mitchell Stark with this wry smile, and he just said, "Do you reckon he's ready to go?" And Stark, he said, "He bowled well today." And I remember that. And then there was the smile. And anyway, um, went to bed that night, didn't hear anything. Um, woke up in the morning, went down for breakfast. This is the day before the game, and. Basically, got back to my room and um, Justin Langer had said, he said, gave me a call. And I, I picked up the phone. He said, hey, Wes. And I said, how are you going? And he said, You've, you're going you're gonna to make your debut for Australia. And I was just like, yep, played it cool, as, as you try to do. <laughs> and said, awesome, thank you. Um, I, I just said, thank you, um, hung up the phone and – I remember I didn't tell my brother. I didn't tell Ash. And he, he basically knew, but we got to training that day and there was a big circle and he said, it's an important day. We've got three guys debuting and he looked at Ash and Ash was smiling and he said, you can see big brother's already smiling and he said, I'd debut. And I think I think that rugby game we played for warm-up, but I didn't get out of first gear and I hung on the right wing trying to get a cheeky um, out, out the side. So I just didn't want to get injured that day. And yeah, the next day was the cap presentation and, I just remember getting to my room the night after that top-up training and me and Ash were in there. And again, having told you the stories um, that I've been through and the journey I'd been through from debuting in South Australia as a youngster, going, then moving home, not being ready, getting smacked around, hadn't really done too much, coming here thinking it was my last chance, to then performing and then to finally being told your dreams being realised, um, it's it makes all of the crap that you go through and all of the hard times and all of the times where you think you're not good enough or you you train hard for nothing. It makes it all worthwhile. Um, and I think I just got in the in my room with Ash and I looked at him and I yeah, it still makes me emotional now. It's it just I just looked at him and I, and and just I guess hugged him and grabbed him um, and didn't let go and just cried and. Gave him a big hug and he just tapped me on the back. He goes, you deserve this. You worked hard for this and you're ready. 
And I guess, yeah, from then on, went to the cut presentation and the rest is history. Yeah, it's pretty funny. <laughs> Amazing story, Halves. Oh, I don't know about oh, you, mate, yeah. but I've genuinely, I've got goosebumps. Like. I was going to say, I could use just about every cliche out of the book there. I've nearly got the tears yeah. going down my eyes, the heart coming out, but beating out of my no. chest, the goosebumps, everything, mate. <laughs> mate, I think, yeah, I think I basically think that the hat presentation that yeah, everyone might have seen if they hadn't seen it, yeah, that video that was out of, of the presentation on my hat, the words that were spoken in that, I think from the things I've said here today, probably – make more sense now um, and is a reason why I guess Ash was so emotional at the time. He's been with me through everything um, and he's my big brother and I guess he's had a quote. He always, he said, it's the best moment he's had in a cricket field and I I hate believing that because watching your brother's plays is so, you get so proud of them and um, but to hear someone say that after they've done so much in their own careers to say that they're their favourite moment is watching their brother play. It just shows like the, the person he is and the love he has for for us. Might have, might have changed after they won the T Twenty World Cup. We'll have to go back to him and find yeah. out. <laughs> he might still be on cloud nine. <laughs> oh, yeah, lucky. I, I don't know about you. Tell me what you feel. I feel like a bit of a proud father after all the stories that Wes has told, and it's just like come to that pinnacle. Oh, it's unbelievable. Yeah, it was awesome. Um, and I guess obviously I, I want to achieve more. I don't think I've reached my best yet. I think I'm far from the, the player I can be. Um, I didn't take a wicket um, and I want to. I want to play for a shard. I want to play two games. I want to play as much as I can. And playing that, given that taste, it just gives you a drive to be um, as good as you can. And, and it's given me that taste. And now I will work harder and I don't think I'll ever be fulfilled. I think I'm my favourite person to read books on or listen to podcasts is Matthew McConaughey and he says, he has a line where he says um, there's eternal finish lines and I think for me that's what I think about when I think of cricket and it's an eternal finish line and, and you've got your career but you want to make the most out of it and I don't think you're ever done or you ever feel like you've fully uh, satisfied. Um, but, yeah, I will always be striving for more. Oh, mate, definitely, definitely. And I know that your story's already had a lot of twists and turns, a lot of ups and downs, but it's really, it's only just beginning. I mean, you're only 24. You've still got plenty of years left, and I think it's definitely your international career is far from unwritten. Looking forward to hopefully seeing you cracking there um, towards the summer. But where, where do you think your future lies in the short term and long term? Do you think it's more the white ball stuff, of course, or the red ball, a bit of both? Like where are you sort of thinking where where we'll see Wes play more in yeah. the future? I think I've got to be realistic about it. Um, I've got my chance in white ball. I think if I'm going to play for Australia in in the near future, I think my best chance of doing that is in white ball. But I want to be a three-form cricketer. Um, I know I'm good enough and have shown in that year I had my success that I, I'm good enough in, in all three formats. Um, so I, I definitely wouldn't pigeonhole myself um, to play test match cricket is a dream and a goal of mine. Um, but I guess... Any, any format for Australia is what you want to play, but I think in the near future, my best chance of playing for Australia is in the shorter format um, with obviously the the aspiration of the ultimate goal of having that uh, dearly treasured baggy green that um, so few get to have. Mate, I'll tell you what though, I might have to contact Will. If he opens up a market for uh, for Wes to be a three-format uh, player, I'll definitely <laughs> be chucking a tenner on it. <laughs> Oh, I can't go in on that. I might get in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> now, mate, before we uh, get our little quizzing hats on, we've got a few questions that we uh, ask at the end of every episode. I, I think it's a re- really good time to ask it as well. It's like come to the perfect point, really. So first one, what do you want to have achieved by the end of your cricketing career? That's a, that's a, that's a long list, I hope. Um, <laughs> I, if I'm talking realistic, I want to be a three-format cricketer for Australia. Um, I want to be someone that doesn't play once and, and never again. Um, I'm, I'm realistic in knowing that that's genuinely a possibility as it is in, in, in any line of, of work. Um, that it's something that um, no one really deserves. You work for it and you, you work hard for it. And if you get it, um, you got to keep working hard to keep it. Um, but I want to be a three-format cricketer for Australia. 
Um, I would love to play as many first class games for South Australia as I can. Um, I'd love to win a shield title with South Australia. Um, I think we're on a great track to do that at the moment with the group we have, the coaching staff and the, and, and the track we're on at the moment is something that is really important to me. And I think that's something that's really special to me. I, I want to end my career knowing that I won a shield title with my brothers. Um, and that's something that is, yeah, that, that hits home. If that, if I could do that, I'd be a very happy person. Um, and most of all, I want to be someone that, that people can look at and, and see as a role model. I want to, I want to be someone that, that people look at and the way I go about playing the game, the way I go about, uh, how I hold myself on the field and off it. I hope that um, young kids or parents can see me as a person that goes, we want our children or the kids to say, I want to play cricket for Australia. And I think that's it. If we can inspire young generations to keep playing cricket, um, this great game is going to keep moving forward. So I'd love to, yeah, achieve as much as I can. Like I said, eternal finish lines. Yeah, that's awesome, mate. Uh, Definitely a little quote to live by there, the eternal finish lines. I like that. And next one. When you're maybe sitting around the campfire in, I don't know, 50, 60 years, you're with your grandkids and uh, you're kind of saying, uh, re- reflecting on just what, what you've achieved in life. What do you want to have in- achieved in life by that time? Uh, I guess for me, pff, cricket doesn't come into that. Yeah, cricket doesn't come into that. I think for me, it's really important that, I hold a lot of value and I got this from my brother Ash to be a good person, a really good person off the field to have respect, to earn it, um, to be a loyal man, uh, um, to be true to my word um, and to be honest always. I think for me, if I'm sitting around the campfire and I've got grandkids, I think I've achieved enough um, to have a solid family um, and I think that's something for me in life that hopefully happens one day. I'm, I'm in no rush <laughs> with that. With that, but I think yeah, if I can be a good role model, have a, have a good family, um, and teach maybe my children one day to be be good people, then I find that as, as successful enough in life. Mate, great answer. And now we've got our final question before we move on to the uh, the quiz. It's uh, it's a life philosophy. Do you have any few little words that you sort of live your life by? Uh not really. I'm pretty take it. Go, I'm pretty happy go lucky bloke. Um, just be a good person. Um, and I know that's a pretty broad saying, but um, it's actually it can be hard sometimes. But as long as you've got a good set of values, um, which I I work, I try to work on every day. Um, I got my core set of values and, and, and to to make me the best person I can be and give a hundred percent whatever I'm doing. Um, yeah. You always give a hundred percent and don't half ass it, hey, buddy. How I tell you what is it possible for Wes to give a bad answer, Harps? Yeah, terrific <laughs> absolutely, answer. Absolutely loving it. I tell you, what, I hope he doesn't answer questions as well yeah. as he uh, <laughs> as he goes on the quiz. So Harps, yeah, here we go. Hit, hit music, and I'll hit the music. Jeez, I'll tell you what, I was talking about the goosebumps that I was getting before. I got those goosebumps with that music again. They've come up again in this interview because it is quiz time, our favourite time on the podcast. It's been a cracking, cracking episode, this one. It's going to go to another level with this quiz, I'm telling you, boys. Uh, so, uh, Wes, the thing we always do every episode, I've got five questions that all have a very vague, very loose connection to you and your career. I'm going to pit you up against Lockie. Uh, five questions and battle name of the is big your dogs. Battle of the big that dogs. I'm looking. It is the battle it. of the big dogs. Where's it gets lucky? Are these uh, questions about me too? They're not so questions I'm about to win. you. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're, it's like uh, you, you, okay, you'll see. It's not like uh, how many wickets did you take against the West Indies? Nothing like that. But uh, I'll, I'll give you. <laughs> uh, okay. Moving on for that. Question one. Uh, your name is your buzzer, like I said, just buzzing with Wes or Lockie. So question one. Uh, Wes, this isn't the actual question. You were born on Feb 5, yeah? Yes. Okay, Feb 5. So this Harper's is got that wrong before, pin- so he has to check. Yeah, <laughs> you have to check. I did get that wrong. It was quite embarrassing. Uh, question one is closest to the pin question. So something else that happened on February the 5th in 1869 in the Victorian town of Maligal. 
the welcome stranger uh, got <laughs> discovered, and it's the biggest alluvial gold nugget ever found uh, in Victoria. Ever found ever? It was found in Victoria. So closest to the pin, how much does this gold nugget weigh? I, I just want to look at Wes's eyes as they popped this. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I don't think he was expecting this. I think it's fair to say. Oh. Um, the largest gold nugget. Uh, not the, the, biggest. the biggest ever gold nugget found, alluvial gold nugget. How much does it weigh closest to the pin? This is why he came up with this podcast, mate. It, these kind of questions. Mate, it's pretty heavy. Gold's pretty heavy. It this is. one is quite heavy, I, I would say. Oh, yeah. I'm really nervous to answer because I'm thinking if I do something way off. <laughs> yeah, I know. I was about to say, oh, 30 kilos, but I'm like, no, that <laughs> doesn't sound when it's, when it's a ton. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm, uh, uh, Wes. Wes. Six and a half kilos. Six and a half kilos is incorrect. Mm. It's closest yeah. to the pin. You can you can still get the point. So, lucky. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go a bit higher. You know what? I could be go soft and go seven kilos or whatever. But you know, I'm I'm a. I'm, I'm, I'm willing to put my. <laughs> That's what I thought you were gonna do. I'm willing to put my neck on the line. Uh, I'm gonna go. <laughs> oh, oof. I'm gonna go three hundred kilos. No, that doesn't sound right. Hundred kilos. Let's go. Wait, no, wait. No, stuff it. 30, 30. I'm going 30. Is 30 your final answer? Oh, lock, lock it in, in lock it in. Uh, Where's his eyes when I idiot. said 300? He thought, who's this idiot? Do so I get another two guesses as well? No. <laughs> <laughs> Where's, mate, we need a bit of a poker face from you there. If you stuck with the 300 kilos, you would have had the point. But uh, lock it on 30, and the answer is 97 kilos. So oh, oh nice. He's three off. Well done. Well, he changed to 30, so he was yeah. a bit more than three off. Uh, but he gets the point. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you what, Six Wes. I'm, 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 happy, I'm happy to invite you to play poker. Jesus. <laughs> yeah, I know. Jeez, uh, mate, I was going to say, six and a half kilos. I reckon I found a six and a half kilo bit of gold at Sovereign Hill. Like, <laughs> geez, that's not much at all. <laughs> oh, mate. <laughs> we'll move on to question uh, two. Next what, question. Okay, next question. Next question. I know you've got places to the B, so we'll <laughs> we'll get we'll through this. Question two. So, of course, uh, University of Adelaide. You played for the cricket team there. A famous person who went to the University of Adelaide, Julia Gillard. She began an arts degree at the University of Adelaide in which decade? Lockie, I Lockie. reckon it have to have been. 80s. 80s. Well, I can tell you she was born in 1961. So she went to the University of Adelaide and from 1981 to 1982. So it's got it absolutely spot on. Very nicely done. Where's a look of despair on your face there? I'm How telling you, that? When, when these things are happening, I'm like that. It's like that monkey in Homer's head going. <laughs> <laughs> That's my head at the moment. I'm sitting here and there's a monkey right there spinning around. <laughs> <laughs> Lockie's done oh, quite sure. well there, I must say. Well uh, done, Lock. Well done. Well, yeah, well done indeed. Uh, Wes, I feel like with your knowledge of country music, this could be a good question for you. Good. So Feb 5, we we're, were talking about Feb 5 before, born on Feb 5. Another thing that happened on Feb 5, not not such a happy thing as you being born, Banjo Patterson, he passed away on Feb 5 in 1941. Banjo Patterson, the lyricist to Waltzing Matilda, so, a bit of a different question, this one. I'm going to flip between you two. You've got to recite a line. Just go from the start of Waltz and Matilda. Go line by line. Go between <laughs> you. And whoever gets it wrong first loses the point. Uh, do you kind of get what I'm saying there? Yeah, got it. Okay, cool. So, uh, Lockie, uh, you can start since I've you're... I've got no oh, idea. Oh, who, Wes, would you like I'll to start? start? You, you start, okay. Once a jolly swagsman. Yep. Uh, is down by the Billabong one. Down by oh okay I'll let you have another go it's not quite down by the bill bomb it's close do you want do you want to have it once a jolly swagman what's the bit after that down by I don't know down down by the billy I've got no idea <laughs> <laughs> he's bombed out early there it's incorrect uh, it is, is it camped, camped along the billabong bomb. camped yeah. by billabong oh. yeah my sound effects aren't working there we go there I want to add that because I have the last next one too oh like that's <laughs> That's not a bad song. <laughs> Wes, would you like to, You could go. Just go through it as much oh, as you want. No. You're all, no. Okay, okay, okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. 
<laughs> Frequent listeners to the show like uh, know that we kind of like to mash up people singing songs a bit and remix them a bit. So you probably got away with not doing it there. Um, yes. Anyway, we'll move, we'll move to question four. Uh, Wes is down to one, Lockie, two, one up. So WA, your initials, WA, of course, also meaning Western Australia. So a bit of a geography question for you, this one. Bordering Western Australia is one state, one territory, and two oceans. Can you name those things? Lockie. Lockie. Uh, Need to get them all for the point. Yeah, the state is South Australia. Yep. And then two territories, did you say? Or one? One territory. Northern Territory. Yep. And then it'd be the Pacific Pacific Ocean. The Pacific Ocean is incorrect. (laughs) Where's... Well, we've got everything, so it's the oceans now. Uh, Atlantic Ocean? The Atlantic Ocean is also incorrect. What? Do you know the Indian Ocean The Indian Ocean and the Southern Ocean. I was going to say Indian, but there I wouldn't go. have got the other one. Yeah. Well, anyway, that, that was the fourth question. The scores remain at 2-1 to Lockie. We're on to question five here, but Wes yes. is still very much in with a shot. I'm I'm in the game. He could he could probably take the win out here because our last question is a who am I question. By the way, Harper, when, when we review the quiz after, that, that question is getting a big fat zero. That question sucked. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, mate. Well, I, I'm speaking about who am I question. I, I got your who am I question on like the five points when you hosted the quiz once. <laughs> anyway, so, mate, back, back to the so, quiz, back to the quiz. Let's yeah. go. Let's focus on the big thing. You don't on. have a go at the quiz master. I, I think over 50 episodes or whatever, you should have learnt that. But move to question five. Start. Um, so, who am I? Question. We start with a five-point clue, all leading down to a one-point clue, uh, and yeah, you, once you buzz in and get it wrong, you can't go again until the other person gets it wrong. Where's you need two points to win? We all clear. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Let's start with a five-point clue. I was born on the fifth of February, nineteen seventy. Same birthday as you, obviously, a few years earlier, in South Australia's oldest mainland country town. I've got no idea. Move on to the four point clue. Oh, oh, actually. Oh, okay. No, nah, you got no. No, nah, I'm good. I'm good. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Where's move to the? F- oh, oh, yeah. Where's? <laughs> no, no. Oh, oh, okay, go for five points if you want. That's a big win if you <laughs> get nah, it right. I only need to. I only need to. Keep okay, going. Okay, <laughs> conservative. Move to the four point clue. I played for SANFL club Central District at a junior level, and after dropping out of school to work in a Holden factory refused an offer to join the newly formed Australian Cricket Academy. Wes. Wes. Darren Lehman. Darren Lehman. If you get it here, you've won at 5-2. That's a very, very good comeback. I'll get a bit of a drum roll going. Darren Lehman is absolutely correct. Mate, how the hell am I meant to get that? That is, that, how, how the hell am I meant to compete with Wes on that? <laughs> <laughs> no, this is Look, this is I was going to guess Darren Lehman after the first one, <laughs> but I thought, oh wait. And then when he said Cricket Academy, I was like, yeah, it has to be. In. I was very nicely done. Look, I I didn't I, I wasn't sure if you'd get it that early, but you've done very nicely there. Lucky you usually Give, giving wins. a cricketer, I wanted, I wanted a cricket, to give I'm the cricket coach. Right? How's how's that fair, mate? <laughs> Listen, <laughs> mate, boys, you go to uni and you should have got the oceans. Let's be honest. <laughs> oh yes, my <laughs> 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 geography. Oh, I could have guessed anything. <laughs> <laughs> no, it evens out. Uh, not too many oceans in a law textbook, but uh, look, we're moving on. We're moving on. <laughs> <laughs> Another superb quiz, a superb win for a guest, which we haven't seen for a long, long time. Wes, if you've got anyone you'd like to dedicate that to, there was a long list of people before that you mentioned. Anyone you'd like you know to give what? a shout it's to? It's just, uh, nah, it's an honour to win that quiz. Um, best man won. Uh, <laughs> Nah, nah, boys. It's been a, it's been a bloody pleasure being on here. I've I've loved chatting with you. Um, it's been awesome, and yeah, I guess obviously I spoke about my journey. Um, and now I have played for Australia. It's it's those people that that were there at the very start that allowed me to realise my dream. I mentioned Pete, Emma, have a hawk. Um, their two children, Matilda, Harper, um, the Ludbrook family. Um. Uh, Adelaide Uni Cricket Club and all the other people that were involved along the way, my own family, um, people like that um, allow you to aspire to to work hard to, to realise your dreams and, and the people that help you along the way don't realise how much they mean and, and they mean the world to me and I'm 
eternally grateful for their input in in my career and my life. Nah, mate, we're so, we're just super grateful to get you know you you on the potty. Um, I guess losing the quiz to a good person, I guess. I couldn't lose to a better bloke. Um, <laughs> nah, just kidding. I don't want to lie to the listeners. We better cut that out. No. <laughs> nah, but seriously, mate, it's been an absolute pleasure and it's just been amazing to get a bit of insight into your story. It's truly amazing. Thanks so much, boys, and thanks for having me on. No, it's been an absolute pleasure. If anyone wants to check it out, uh, we're just going to do a little Q&A on our Instagram page at WDWBpod. Looking forward to seeing that. Looking forward to what you have to offer, Wes. Thank you so much again. That was absolutely brilliant. Awesome. Cheers, guys. We'll see you next week, guys. There's a monkey spinning around. <laughs> it's an honor to win that quiz. Thanks so much, boys, and thanks for having me on. <laughs>